Hello and welcome everyone. This is Users Aren't an Add-on, Building the User Perspective into the Design Process. My name is Robert Frawley and on behalf of Site Tech Global, I'm excited to have you join us today. In today's 30-minute session hosted by Perkins Access, you'll hear from Jeff Freed, Director at Perkins Access, Gary Assant, Director at Perkins Access, Jerry Barrier, Director of Education Technology at Perkins School for the Blind, Karen George Gillis, MBA candidate at Harvard Business School, Tom Lutkowski, VP of Accessibility Product at Comcast. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available post-event on our YouTube channel and will also be appended to the agenda. Please remain on mute during this session. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box. Uh, please know we also have live captioning running as well, and you should see it at the bottom of your screen. Great, so without further ado, please take it away, Jeff. Thanks, Robert. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming to today's breakout session, and I especially want to thank our uh, panelists. We'll um, get underway with some questions in just a second, but I would just want to set the stage with a few opening remarks. Uh, here at Perkins Access, we're passionate about helping organizations create usable and accessible experiences for people who are blind or low vision and in the end for everybody. And today we're not only excited to be here at Site Tech Global hosting this session, but we're really happy to be launching our new Perkins Access Inclusive Design Guide, which is focused on helping design teams put principles into practice that focus directly on the user. In fact, inclusive design begins with bringing users with disabilities into the conversation at the very earliest stages of a product's development. Uh, you know, as designers, we may sometimes make assumptions about what's the best approach or the most effective solution in terms of accessibility, but those assumptions may not always be the right ones. So rather than assuming, of course, um, in order to find out what works best for users with disability, um, it's best to ask that question too users with disabilities. The uh, Perkins Access Inclusive Design Guide, as well as the things that you learn from today's session from our panelists, will help you use the knowledge you gain from working with people with disabilities to guide your decisions as you design the user experience. So when you're trying to design something specifically to help uh, users who are blind or low vision, we know that accessibility should be included on day one of the planning process. But, of course, before the planning process can even take place, first you have to have an idea for a new product. So with that in mind, Jerry, you're up first. This first question I wanna ask you is, how do you even determine if there's a challenge for someone who is blind that actually needs to be addressed? Okay, hi everybody. Uh, although it may seem obvious to you that your idea addresses a significant need for people who are blind, bear in mind that you may be wrong. Um, it's difficult, unless you're very familiar with uh, issues faced by people who are blind, to know what are challenges and, and what are not. Um, if you know a blind person, it might be a good idea to present your idea to that person and just chat about it and see what they what their response is. But again, uh, that person may give you some answers from their perspective, but they don't represent all blind people. So it's not enough just to talk to one blind person. I certainly always think I represent everybody who's blind, as many of us do, but in reality, none of us do. We all come from our own particular backgrounds and have our own particular skill sets and so on. So you can't rely just on what one person says. Uh, the next thing you might want to consider doing is reach out to a local agency that serves people who are blind and see if you can talk to someone there about your idea and perhaps they can uh, put you in contact with some other people. And um, Another really good thing to do, I think, is to try to find a group of blind people who are interested in technology. And there are a number of them around the, the uh, country. We have one here in Boston called Vibug, uh, which has uh, been around for many years. It started out as a computer group. 
and now uh, deals with all types of adaptive technology. So try to find a group that uh, of people who are blind. It might be through one of the major adv advocacy groups or it could be a smaller group, but present your idea to them and see what they have to say about it. And bear in mind, you're gonna hear a lot of negativity sometimes and don't let that necessarily dissuade you, but listen to everything people say. You know, don't be easily talked out of your good idea, but hear what people are saying and take it into consideration. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing might be to peruse the literature. Has this idea already surfaced somewhere else? Has somebody done it? Has somebody failed at it? If so, why did they fail? If they succeeded, maybe you need to find a new idea to work with. And if your research indicates that your idea truly does seem to be a good one, the next step might be uh, to get help from a, a college engineering class or some similar group that might be interested in, your, in uh, kind of uh, fleshing out your idea as a project for one of their courses. So that's, uh, I think, a way to get started. Thank you. Um, I got a follow-up question for you and any of the other panelists, if you um, have any questions about anything Jerry has said, um, we, we have time for that as well. But Jerry, you mentioned something about um, expect a lot of negativity. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is that just, you know, cynicism or is there something else going on here? No, I, I'll be happy to talk about that. Um, people don't like change. And a lot of times when somebody hears something brand new, uh, their immediate reaction was, that, that's a dumb idea. That's not a very good idea. But that doesn't make it so. So uh, that's the kind of negativity I was referring to. Not that we're any more negative than the general population, uh, but we hear a lot of things from people. And I've heard people uh, give a hands-down response to something that turned out to be a terrific idea. I've done it myself. I won't go into detail, but I could tell you things that I thought were just ridiculous that have turned out to be absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Um, so when, when uh, you know, as a designer or an inventor, if I you know, bring my idea to uh, a group of people who are blind or visually impaired, and um, I'm, you know, I'm, I will expect negativity. I hope I can expect some positive reactions as well. But um, do you find that, um, is it easy to bring the negativity around, uh, you know, either with showing them a new product or with more discussion? I think it is if people get the sense that it's a good product or a good concept. Um, it, you really have to listen to what everybody says to you and um, really take what they say seriously, uh, but also keep your own perspective in mind. If you're convinced that it's a great idea, but five or 10 people say to you, well, it's not something we have a problem with. You know, we don't really need a product to enable us to do that particular thing. Sure. You know, then take that, take that seriously also. Yeah, I see. I see. Okay, good. Um, Gary, Tom, Karen, uh, any follow-up questions from you? No, I do. Um, if I can just add to, you know, Jerry's point, um, I, on the flip side, I mean, I do think it's very important to listen to what people say and their opinions of things. But at the same time, you have to be very careful of, uh, you know, people saying things that they like your idea because they don't want to offend you. So yes. there's a, such a thing as, you know, researcher bias or moderator bias, where, you know, people that are part of that research might just say, yeah, I think that's a good idea because they don't want, want to hurt your feelings. So you do have to, on the flip side, sort of try to judge, you know, body language and, you know, interest in the idea as well and be wary of that. Yeah, and, and something I'd add to that as well, um, not that we're trying to create reasons for you to have a clouded positive view of your idea, but a, a simple verbal description is sometimes not enough for people to understand the value of a concept. So, of course, like Jerry is saying, um, you know, just have a conversation, but also if, if some sort of, um, I won't even call it a prototype, just embodiment of what you're talking about helps facilitate that conversation. It can give a better, uh, a more accurate, it'll elicit more accurate responses, which may be yes or no. Okay, all right. Uh, Jerry, thanks very much. <clears throat> You're welcome. I want to move on now to um, the next question. And Karen and Gary, this one is for you. 
I'm a designer and I'm looking to gather and integrate feedback about my new product from users who are blind or with low vision, but I have no idea what my options are. Um, you know, how can I possibly put together a group that represents all, that, we, that represents people with all types of visual disabilities? That's one thing. And the other thing is, what do I do once I've gathered my group together? How do I begin? Great question, Karen. You wanna you wanna take off on that one? I'll sure. Um, there's three things I'd recommend, and the first is if you're fortunate enough to have a research budget, um, I highly recommend using a professional recruiter. If you're familiar with them, um, you may not know that they have really um, or some firms have robust databases, lists upon lists, of users of any specific um, qualification that you you're looking for, including blind and visually impaired users. And the great thing about reaching out to them is it creates this really virtuous cycle. You asking for these particular users is sending them a demand signal, which encourages them to make these databases even more robust. So the next time you reach out, um, you have an even broader set of users to pick from. But if, if you're not quite at that stage in terms of research, regardless of what I'm testing, the first uh, participant victim usually just ends up being whoever is in arm's reach, the coworker that like happens to share a desk cluster with you. And so ideally, if you're an organization that's working towards a holistically diverse workforce, um, you can start with someone in your building or your floor. Um, and this is just a, another uh, unintended benefit of like including these users as employees of your company. And it's another thing to add in initiatives that are, are trying to work towards a more holistically diverse workforce. And then finally, um, adding color to what Jerry said about reaching out to specific advocacy groups. I would also just suggest, even if it's something much less formal than an advocacy group, just going to where these users are. So public meetups, conferences <laughs> that um, would attract the specific type of users you're looking for. I've had a lot of success with public meetups um, with very specific diagnosis groups. Um, and of course, like reaching out ahead of time to whoever's organizing in your group at large to explain your intent and get a little goodwill first. Um, but, you know, every time I've tried this with a, a specific user set group, they've been excited that someone is um, specifically looking to talk to them and genuinely get their input. Yeah, and to add what, um, you know, Karen is saying about finding people, I think social media is a great platform uh, to recruit research participants. Um, you know, we already talked about, um, you know, some other ways, you know, meetups and recruiting firms, um, but also, for example, um, at Perkins, we've built a, a, a design or a, a research community of users um, who are blind and visually impaired, and we recruited those individuals through um, our social media platform, which is called the Blind New World, uh, which has about 83,000 uh, followers across Facebook, um, Instagram, and Twitter. And so just reaching out and finding members of those communities to participate in research uh, is, is a great way to find uh, people. Um, and then I would also stress the importance of making sure that you have a diverse set of uh, people in your research sample, right? You want to not just listen to one person, as Jerry mentioned, but make sure that you have, you know, depending on the research, at least five to 10 people and look for a variety of perspectives. So, you know, you want to try to find people who have, uh, for example, been blind since birth or perhaps people who develop blindness later in life. Those perspectives might be very different. Um, and so, you know, just trying to get as many different perspectives, I think, is, is really critical um, when you're doing research on your on your product. Got a follow-up question actually uh, for Karen to start with. Um, you mentioned um, sometimes the best place to start is if you have coworkers with disabilities to you know, get some immediate feedback. Um, doing that, I just wanna be clear, I guess, doing that shouldn't replace anybody's feeling for the need of gathering a larger group together, but you're talking more like a, using that as a sort of quick concept test. Right. Not as like Jerry said, you know, this coworker speaking for a larger group. Of course. And um, what I had mentioned earlier in response to Jerry's um, comments about how, you know, it's, it's useful to have something in addition to a verbal description. Um, I, I feel like the coworker threshold is best for that is, hey, I want to take this 
rough thing out to people? Can you give me um, a, a, a quick 30 second view of it just so that when I, I do get the gift of other people's time and attention, I'm, I'm presenting something or sure. a description that's worthy of their time. Sure. Yeah, great. Uh, and for both of you, um, I, I think we've all run into this before. Um, sometimes the people who are, say, the most sophisticated users uh, or, you know, the software designers or, um, you know, people who are super duper with assistive technology, um, are they always the best people to have in the group? group i mean do you want to have some super users like that and some you know more uh, uh you know less experienced users less sophisticated users is that a good thing to do yeah, yeah i think you know when you're trying to find people to give you that feedback on your product really think of it as who's going to be using my product right and you know if it's a set of people who are very familiar with technology then you know, that might be the right audience to bring in. But typically you wanna be very wary of you know, including people that are you know, too close to understanding technology um, right. if the individuals that will be using your product are not, you know, do not fit that segment. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you might wanna have a mix of people who are uh, technology savvy and, and some who, who are not. I mean, it really depends on the product and the type of product that you're building. Right. Yeah, and I would add that um, sometimes having that test with the user that uh, isn't uh, as savvy is actually the most productive thing you can do because if you if you present a concept to a, a very tech savvy person and they go through it uh, flawlessly, either your product is perfect, which I'm is maybe <laughs> it might, that is a possibility. I don't think it's likely. So either your product is perfect or they're just so good at figuring these flavors of things out that they were able to navigate it, and that's frankly, a waste of your time. You need it to be kind of a disastrous thing for you to figure out what are the to-dos um, to move to a better version. Okay, all right. Um, great, thank you both. Um, I'm gonna move on to Tom. Uh, <clears throat> saving um, this question for you, Tom. You know, we, um, we often talk about making things accessible to all users. But as we're finding out, in some cases, that's not necessarily the goal, right? Uh, this conference, for example, uh, it's focused specifically on new products and technology for users who are blind or low vision. So in this particular context, we're not necessarily thinking about a product's wider usability. But you know me, I like to ask questions. So this question. <laughs> My question for you is, um, should designers of targeted products, like the ones we're going to be seeing over the next couple of days, um, should designers of targeted products like these nonetheless still be thinking about or considering how these products can be usable or benefit a wider audience? I would say yes, um, because you always want your broader audience. Uh, you want your product to be usable by the widest possible audience, poss you know, and so you know, I think we're in an age in technology of personalization. You know, you have your experience, I have my experience, but we're, we're consuming the same content, maybe uh, arriving at it from a different means. Um, and so I, I think you do want to consider because you're going to find a broader value. I mean, if we think about features, uh, Jeff, that I know that you've been involved with, or we together in our time, uh, in this field, uh, closed captioning, right, was, was set up for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, but look at where closed captioning has gone now. It's, it's you, know, you know, a mainstay with, within, you know, uh, media, um, whether it's online, um, whether you're, you know, when we were traveling back in the day when things were normal uh, in airports and bars and gyms and you know, just about anywhere in a public venue uh, where maybe you couldn't hear the audio of a show. Um, so, so I think it's to the designer's advantage, to the product owner's advantage to, of course, start from the primary use case that you're looking at. You know, uh, if we're going to build, which we have done a, a talking guide for our X1 platform, we call it voice guidance. Think about it as a screen reader inside of a set-top box for people who are blind or visually impaired. Of course, we're going to start from that primary use case because that's the main intent of why we would develop this feature but that doesn't mean that we're not interested in 
uh, individuals who are dual learners, visual and oral learners, right, um, who could benefit from this guide, uh, and, and other and other folks who might just want the screen read to them versus you know uh, you know having to read the screen themselves. I think we hear a lot about you know multiple users. We hear a lot about um, you know disability being the mismatch between the person and the environment in which they're operating in. So you're trying to read your uh, email, you know, um, in a sun splash, you know, sky on a beach. Now, while you're checking email while you're on the beach, I don't know, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, that doesn't work. Um, so if you could have that that spoken to you, there you go. Or better yet, if you're driving, we don't want you, you know, looking down at the screen trying to send a text message. Um, and and so you know maybe audio is 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 better there. So so I I would say yes because you're going to find other uses for that that product, but you always start from the primary use case that gets the majority of your time and investment, and then you look you know uh, to move and push out beyond that. Okay, um, I got a couple of follow up questions, but first, Jerry, uh, Gary, Karen, do you have anything? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I do. Um, you know, Tom, you know, particularly with the voice remote, um, it's really, you know, to me, I think it's so critical to think of like multimodal mm -hmm. experiences, right? So multimodal input. So through the voice remote, you can use your voice to look up a, um, a program that you want to watch. Um, but for example, my, my son has a speech impediment and he sometimes cannot use that voice remote to you know, search for something. So there's all sorts of other really great ways that uh, Comcast has created a way for him to find the shows that he wants to watch. So just wondering if you could speak to a little bit of that and the research that you did as far as, you know, supporting those use cases for all, all users. Sure, so, you know, voice came about because it's just an easier way for, you know, the mainstream audience to get at content. Uh, you don't have to, navigate that pro program grid of a thousand channels to try and find something you want to watch. Um, and, you know, for somebody who's blind, you don't have to remember channel numbers, those types of things. You just say, you know, watch NBC or, you know, show me movies about baseball or even give it a quote, like we're going to need a bigger boat and all of a sudden Jaws appears on the screen. So, you know, I think those are the types of things, um, but you're right, um, being able to use uh, an on-screen keyboard uh, be besides um, voice is is right. You know, what we have in a, a web remote that we built um, is the ability to, you know, text a voice command. So somebody who's deaf, you know, voice isn't gonna work, people with speech impediments, um, other other disabilities. Um, so you know, we've, we've looked at this in ways of, you know, What's the end game? The end game is to search for content, to find the content you want to watch, or you know, perform some sort of action. Now, what are the multiple inputs that are uh, available to us to enable that experience to be uh, inclusive to the widest possible audience? And then, you know, with voice, we do about a billion voice commands a month, but you know, these other searches are are equally you know popular as well. Yeah. You know, Tom, one of the things you said early on <clears throat> when you were talking about closed captioning, um, one of the great benefits of, of captions is that, um, you know, if you're in a family or in a group where you've got a mixed audience, um, you've got viewers who are deaf or hard of hearing, you've got viewers who can hear, um, captions benefit them all. And you're talking about the same thing here in the designs that you're describing where um, you, you've got a set-top box or some other device that provides a benefit for users who are blind, visually impaired. But obviously that also enables group participation, <clears throat> which I yeah. think is something that is sometimes overlooked when we talk about these kinds of design aspects is that, um, you know, we always say accessible design benefits everybody, but it also enables participation, you know, in the group, in society, broader, you know, to, to look more broadly. Talk a little bit about that for a minute or so. Sure. So uh, I think there's it's a great example of that, right? Mixed use households. So in my case, my wife and son, as you know, are, are sighted. Um, and first thing they learned was the shortcut key that we added to turn on and off the talking guide, right? And, <laughs> and they don't even let me get out of the room uh, before they turn the darn thing off. Uh, so 
you know, but then when I come back in, you know, I turn it on uh, and I can use it. Um, you know, we see that in mobile devices, Android devices, uh, iOS devices, where, you know, a, a blind person and a sighted person could share the same phone or, you know, my wife could be driving and somebody could text her and she'd be like, hey, could you read this text? She hands me her phone. I turn on, you know, voiceover, which is the screen reader for iOS and I'm off and running. And so, I think you really want to look at, you know, this multimodal experience that, that Gary mentioned. Um, and, and that's really what you get in these mixed use uh, scenarios where that same device is usable by all sorts of individuals. And I think what we're getting to right now in this, uh, in this technology age is, you know, sometimes these uh, devices can have this kind of mixed use built in. Um, but, you know, leveraging the cloud uh, where, for example, X1 is a cloud-based platform, um, we don't have to build everything into the box itself. It's not something you have to install. You know, we can, we can update this multimodal experience. We can introduce new experiences directly into the cloud. And so, you know, what you might launch as a minimal viable product, hate that term, but it's used a lot, um, you know, within weeks, months can be iterated upon and updated and you can introduce these new modalities of interaction as you go forward. So, uh, you know, I think that's, that's something to keep in mind as well is that there's just so much more power by having a network connected device that you can introduce some of these technologies or some of these, these experiences that, you know, prior to that would be very difficult to, uh, you know, onboard everything into the device itself. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, certainly thank, thank you to all the panelists. We're just about out of time, but I want to just uh, thank you all once again. Uh, Gary Assant, Director of Consulting at Perkins Access, and Jerry Barrier, Director of Education Technology here at the Perkins School for the Blind. Karen Jordillis, MBA candidate and design strategist. And finally, Tom, uh, VP of Accessibility at Comcast. I want to thank you all for participating and certainly Thank you to uh, everybody who's attending this session right now. We had a good number of attendees and I, I hope you all learned, for, uh, took away something from this session. Um, I want to um, just remind you that um, the, the new Perkins Access Inclusive Design Guide is available for download and you can access this uh, by going to pages.perkins.org slash inclusive hyphen design hyphen guide. Uh, I think one of my colleagues is gonna put that in the chat window as well, but uh, this will be part of the permanent video record. So you'll have access to it that way. And I believe we'll be emailing all the, uh, the attendees and participants as well with that information. Um, <clears throat> I think we had a, a really good discussion today and I think we've sort of covered all of the big broad points that designers need to consider when, um, you know, when they even just start thinking about designing a new product for somebody specifically who's blind or visually impaired. But one of the great takeaways, of course, is that um, those designs being targeted um, will be beneficial to that audience. Um, they can be expanded to be beneficial for everybody. Um, but being able to keep that target in mind when you're uh, putting a group together for initial discussion and development, when you're just trying to gather users together and test out your idea like Jerry was talking about, and then when you're actually putting something on the market like Tom was talking about, the benefits of that, um, the benefits of obvious cloud connection to keep everybody updated, to keep the product updated. Um, I think this was a really good discussion and I, uh, I am glad everyone here was able to attend. Um, and with that, um, I'll bid you all goodbye and I uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of the, uh, the sessions over the next two days. Um, the URL is in the chat. The URL now is part of the video. And you can always uh, just learn more about Perkins Access uh, by going to perkinsaccess.org. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of the sessions. <laughs>